OK, uh, post-op patient. So this is care for any post-op patient. Doesn't matter whether they had a joint surgery, abdominal surgery, brain surgery, or cardiac surgery. Um, preparation and for pre and post-op, uh, especially the care part is the same. So the technically the post-surgical period starts when the last stitch is done. So the wound, wound is closed and then the patient is taken out of the operating room and then enters the PACU. Once in the PACU, the patient is officially in the post-op care period. So our care here revolves around monitoring for complications. How did the patient tolerate both the surgical procedure as well as the medications given because remember in the case of general anesthesia for instance the patient received anesthetics they also received muscle paralyzers and then uh, opioids for pain so the whole time they were receiving a lot of cns depressants so that's why uh, they were intubated okay, for that purpose because it will bound it, it's bound to depress their respirations and they, although they were given reversal agents for the especially for the neuromuscular blocking agent because they had to be paralyzed during surgery uh, um, they have to be because the slightest twitch you know let's say you're dreaming if you're just simply put to sleep when you dream you move then that could cause disastrous um, complications. Let's say the surgeon now, because you moved, then the, the scalpel nicked a vessel, for instance, and then you bleed. Okay, so the, all, all those drugs were necessary. Now, for a same day surgery patient, these are the discharge criteria. Um, these are for minor surgeries, so they have, um, no, they, they can be sent home. Or even for younger people now, we have appendicitis cases wherein the patient doesn't have to stay overnight. They can be, you know, let's say they had surgery for appendectomy uh, the morning, and then they can be discharged in the afternoon, especially if it's a young patient. Uh, as long as they meet these criteria, meaning they can void, they can walk, uh, safely. Um, of course, we don't expect them to drive, but you know they have somebody taking them home. Um, yeah, they they meet requirements. So uh, as soon as these are met, so they can go home. So the PACU nurse is a ICU nurse. Same qualifications, also the same patient nurse to patient ratio. So it's either one is to one, one is to two, or even one is to three depending on the uh, whether or not the patients are stable. So, okay. so they can float between units. If you're working in ICU, you can be floated to PACU and vice versa. PACU nurses, if there are no cases, like right now, there are a lot of canceled elective surgeries. So to keep the PACU nurses employed, uh, they have shifts to be paid you know, earn enough money so they'll be floated to ICU nurses, which of course are full nowadays because of the COVID. But uh, in the cases of ICU and PACU nurses, that's the thing. They become one trick ponies because they're so used to small patient ratios. One is to three is the maximum. The, it will be a disaster for them if they float to a regular floor when the ratios are now one is to eight or even one is to 10 in um, pretty bad days because they are used to so detailed assessments that they take a long time and you can't do that on a med surge floor. So they they lose that um, multitasking um, ability. But you know, after a few uh, days, the, it'll, it'll come back to them. So priority assessments in the PACU are the following. Vital signs will be taken every 15 minutes. 
we check for the return of the neuromuscular functioning. Remember, the patient received um, neuromuscular blocking agent. So the sensation is especially the movement should return. So beginning from the toes and then uh, going up slowly. All the while, all the systems will be will be checked, especially kidney function. So we will look at urinary output. If the patient doesn't have a Foley, then we will check the bladder, then ask the patient you know, if they need to pee. Uh, the dressing will be monitored, pain level. Uh, but again, the if the patient meets if the if the patient's vital signs are stable and then they have the return of the sensations and movement now, um, that's the only criteria for the PACU. So um, all the sensory motor functions are back and then the vital signs are stable, there's no bleeding, then they can be discharged from the PACU and back to the floor. Once that's met, of course, we have to give report. So this is now the handoff report. So the PACU nurse gives this report to the receiving nurse. Um, just like any other admission, so this is considered an admission, although not um, admission from, you know, from the home to the hospital, but the patient is in the OR and then you're admitting them to a post-op uh, clinical area. Uh, that's a given. Um, surgical procedure. So what did the patient have? What anesthesia was used? Uh, how much was the blood loss? Um, what lines are currently running? Okay, what, the, what is infusing? Uh, when was the last time the patient uh, medicated for pain? Okay. Um, any, let's say, Untold, did anything happen during the the surgery, right? Uh, that that would be important to to know. Let's say the patient sustained an injury, for instance, fell from the operating table, which is rare, um, or any any other non-clinical information, such as if the family wants to be notified, for instance, because. Uh, let's say let's let's put it this way you're the family member you have your mom or your husband or your child who had surgery wouldn't you be inquisitive right you'll be bothering these people you know when, when can i see my because they can't see the patient in the PACU so um so the PACU nurse would include that because that would usually noted in the chart that who wants to be called you know as soon as the patient is uh, out of PACU, you know, when they can, when can they see the patient? So those are important, um, both for the patient and the significant others. Any questions on the handoff? Now that is the responsibility of the, of the PACU nurse, right? Now on the side of the receiving nurse, they have their own, own responsibility. The receiving nurse must ensure that the patient sounds stable during the report. If at any time the patient doesn't sound stable or will require a higher level of care, usually the receiving nurse here in the post-op unit has multiple patients, not like the um, ICU or PACU setting wherein they have very small nurse to patient ratios. So if the patient's level of care doesn't sound stable, meaning um, they will require closer monitoring, in your opinion, you can always refuse the transfer. Uh, in the event of a uh, disagreement, then the supervisor steps in. But um, say something, right? If you if you don't feel like it'll be safe for you, for the patient really, to uh, to be under your care if they don't don't sound stable, That's especially in the vital signs. If the if the vital signs are don't reach at least nine above ninety. That's not a stable patient. Question so far? All right, so we did diagnostic tests before the procedure. We continue to do that post-op because we need to monitor um, for complications like bleeding, for instance. Uh, plus, the patient may have chronic conditions at the same time that needs to be uh, managed namely heart failure, COPD, diabetes, kidney disease. So these are all important to continue. 
or liver disease, for instance. Right. So these are the standard ones. Bleeding times, uh, PT, PTT, INR, um, kidney function, because the, there is bleeding, right? So um, you need to maintain um, monitoring of your kidney function. Suppose it's not really high after a stressful event um, like a surgery. However, it can be low because of, uh, especially if it's a non-diabetic because the patient has been NPO at least eight hours, six to eight hours before surgery, and then they were NPO during surgery, and then they continue to be NPO afterwards because the peristalsis um, doesn't normally return right away. Uh, will most likely have anorexia or even nausea vomiting after surgery. Because of the NPO status, most common electrolyte imbalance is always hypokalemia. Unless there is kidney injury, then it would be the opposite. They'll have uh, hyperkalemia. The WBC increase doesn't really happen immediately post-op because this is a clean incision. I mean, we won't do surgery unless the, the patient is infection-free, except, of course, in emergencies. But uh, typically, the WBC, it, it may rise, but that doesn't indicate immediately that the patient has an infection. It may elevate slightly because of an inflammatory response, which is the um, in response to this stressful event, which was surgery. HNH will tell you the amount of blood loss. Uh, these are not routine as x-ray, not really, uh, only for specific patients like heart failure, for instance, uh, ECG also is only done in the PACU, um, but not on the regular floor. So now we go system by system. First is pain management. Monitor for kidney function while on pain management, because uh, that will affect the excretion of the drug especially if you're giving IV because these are given frequently um, the this the the point that should be stressed here is the patient just had surgery so you anticipate pain so you constantly ask if they need pain medication some doctors will order it routinely rather than as needed basis meaning the patient will receive round-the-clock pain medication for the first 12 to 24 hours. Uh, after that, though, pain is expected to subside if the patient's incision is healing normally. Um, continued pain indicates um, something could be wrong. The patient won't stay on IV medication. Of course, when we send them home, they, they'll be on pills. So that's why if you remember last semester under pain, there was a question on equinalgesia, if you remember that. Like what is the equivalent of the IV form of a drug to the PO? Remember? Yes. Okay, yes. so this was the purpose of it. When you discharge the patient, we're not giving them IV. So the doctor needs to know how much was being given during the admission so that he can write an equivalent uh, for discharge okay, on the prescription pad. Uh, not all patients will be on PCA except those with um, specific types of surgeries like um, extensive ones after let's say rupture of um, aneurysm for instance because those incisions are really huge. Uh, they're long incisions, so we anticipate a lot of pain. Also, common painful uh, procedures are joint surgeries, although they'll be on PCA for probably 24 hours, and then we discontinue it. Some patients with bariatric surgeries, uh, most open abdominal surgeries are very painful, so uh, they'll be typically the ones that receive 
medication via PCA. Uh, family visits uh, are encouraged just as long as they don't cause any problems or if your patient doesn't have uh, isn't on contact precautions. Uh, I'm not saying they can't visit, but uh, that you need to uh, teach them to um, you know, observe uh, precautions. Now we go system by system. So neuro strokes are possible after surgery. Remember the varicose triad. The patient started having DVT risk the moment they they became pre-op and then continues to do so during surgery and then especially afterwards. What are the three varicose triad again that cause the increased risk for DVTs? Stasis, you know, okay. immobilization, immobilization. What was the second one, Giselle? The destruction, hemolysis or destruction of the red blood cells is also another one. <clears throat> uh, you mean endothelial injury, injury to the vessel. There you go. Okay, and then the third is hypercoagulability. Right. So we have venous stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability. The patient here, post-op patients especially, has all three. Venous stasis because they're not very mobile yet. So tendency is they'll spend most of their day in bed. Endothelial injury, well, there's no shortage of that. We had thousands, if not millions, of vessels, uh, including capillaries, that were injured during surgery. So there's a lot of stimulation there for the clotting cascade. So each injured vessel will stimulate the clot formation. And then finally, hypercoagulability, the number one uh, example here is the dehydration, because even if we give this patient PO fluid, I mean IV fluids. The fact that the patient remains NPO for an extended period of time keeps their blood um, to a certain extent um, dehydrated. Okay, so they, they suffer some volume loss and then that will of course cause blood to be thick or uh, viscous and that is the um, third uh, leg of the triad. So putting the patient at high risk for DVT. So you continue your DVT prevention. You watch your vital signs. If the patient has any of these two, report it, and the doctor will have no problem giving you fluid boluses to in increase the um, blood pressure and decrease heart rate. You can continue to monitor respiratory rate, although the patient is already off anesthesia, However, you are giving opioids, so it will continue to put the patient at risk for respiratory depression. Temperature, this can do go with two. Uh, hypothermia, in the case of because the patient had, you know, a, a semi-private gown on during surgery. Actually, they're naked already because we remove the gown when you have, when you're draped and uh, your skin prepped. So you're butt naked on that steel, stainless steel operating table. And then um, if you develop malignant hyperthermia, did you ever discuss? I uh, know this will be this semester. I'll discuss malignant hyperthermia separately. Uh, urine output, so for that's kidney function. And then finally, pain management again. I'll leave you responsible for reading 17.2 uh, on your own. So these are the signs and symptoms of complications related to each system. And then the third column is, what do you do about it? Questions, so I'll slowly scroll down here. Neuro, respiratory, cardiovascular, thermoregulation, GI, GU. Okay, this one in G, genital urinary, you have to distinguish whether it's urinary retention versus kidney injury because they're two separate systems right they're uh, renal but the lower part is urinary does that make sense 
That's why you have two specialists there. You have a nephrologist for the kidney, and then you have a urologist for the ur lower urinary tract. Mm -hmm. okay. So for one thing, it's one thing for the kidneys to fail and not make urine. And another thing, if the kidneys are working fine, but then the bladder is the problem, or it could be anywhere along the tract. Let's say you had stones in the ureter or a uh, prostate uh, obstructing um, output. Okay. Um, you remember pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal kidney injury last semester? Yes. Okay, so same thing. So you have to, to determine if there's no urine output, is it because they're not making urine or is it because the urine can't come out? Uh, skin, remember that the patient during, during surgery, were they moving? No. And uh, how long before you can have a pressure injury when you're lying down still? Two hours, right? Two hours alone will give you a pressure injury already. Um, imagine a 10 hour or longer surgery. Are we turning the patient during surgery? No. No, plus you no. have again stainless steel operating table. Um, so the patient can develop pressure injuries. So you monitor for those. And if they did develop one, well, that can't be helped. They had surgery. Um, all you do is just prevent it from getting worse. Uh, pain, of course, you have your um, opioids and non-opioids. So we've discussed pain already last semester. These are two skin complications related to the incision. So you have one, dehiscence, when the incision opens up. And then we have evisceration, which only occurs, of course, in abdominal surgeries because we don't have organs anywhere else. So uh, dehiscence, though, can occur in any, uh, especially joint surgeries like hips and knees. If the patient is obese, it's usually dehiscence occurs in obese patients because of the pressure exerted on the incision. Oh, management for uh, dehiscence. Okay. Uh, first action here is to um, stay with the patient and then call for help and then um, prepare for covering the incision. And then the surgeon will come back and fix it. The in the case of evisceration, same thing. Do not um, leave the patient. So you simply yell for help. Put the patient in a dorsal recumbent position. So that is on their back. Head of the bed can be flat or the highest you can raise it is maybe 10 degrees. The both knees must be flat. So that is dorsal recumbent. So in that position, you, you have no intra-abdominal pressure. So the abdomen is relaxed, so it will prevent further uh, protrusion of your, or eviscerate, further evisceration. Do not attempt to push those things back. Leave them as they are. All you do is uh, cover this with a uh, moistened sterile 4x4, moistened with sterile saline. Cover it until help arrives. But the first action is always ask for help because this is a surgical emergency. So yell for help. Do not leave the patient. The patient is scared already, so they must not be left alone. Uh, question? With, with this one, we, we can't do anything. The, surge, the surgeon has to take the patient back to the OR to fix this. Um, this one, um, they don't have to. They can... Um, research research it or restable it questions and that's post-op care let's go now to gi that is chapter 57 
page 1249. Right. We do not do gastritis. However, it's the, the chapter starts here because the management is under gastritis. Gastritis also causes ulcers from uh, forming. What did I say? Yeah, gastritis can also cause uh, ulcers in the, well, this is the stomach, so yeah, in the stomach. However, when our coverage here is under peptic ulcer disease, which is covering not only the gastric, but also duodenal um, ulcers. Okay, let's start. For this section, the medications, like I said, are here. So let's cover um medications right here oh uh, you know what let's come back to this because you won't it wouldn't make sense unless we discuss the disorder yet okay so let's go to peptic ulcers first so these treatments here will come back to them okay because they're discussed under gastritis so let's start with the peptic ulcers first, and then we'll go back to, because the treatment is not repeated here. It's already discussed. You'll be referred back to gastritis. All right, so what are the causes of peptic ulcers? Thank you for reading, Miss Jasmine. Right here. Um, I'm sorry. Um, where do you want me to start? Uh, start right here. Okay. In the past, stress and anxiety were thought to be. Oh. In the past, stress and anxiety were thought to be causes of PUD, but research has shown that the principal risk factors of PUD are H. pylori infection and NSAID use. Infection with the gram-negative bacterium H. pylori may be acquired through ingestion of contaminated food and water. Familial tendencies such as type O blood has been reported as a predisposing factor, but now is thought to stem mainly from intrafamilial infection with H. pylori. There is also a connection between peptic ulcers and certain medical conditions, such as chronic obstructive lung disease and chronic renal failure, but the cause is unclear. Other causes include exposure to irritants, trauma, psychogenic factors, and normal aging. Alcoholic beverages stimulate gastric acid production and high concentrations of alcohol to the gastric muco mucosa cause mucosal injury. Cigarette smoking may predispose people to PUD and may interact with H. pylori and NSAIDs to increase mucosal injury. Smoking also impairs ulcer healing and increases ulcer re recurrence. In rare cases, peptic ulcers are found in patients with a gastrin secreting tumor causing profound acid secretions as part of Zoll, Zoll, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Okay, very good. So that is very self explanatory. Let me just explain the first statement. It says here in the past. Okay, so this was true long ago, not anymore. Now, if you're thinking of let's say somebody who has uh, Cushing syndrome or Cushing's disease who has a high level of cortisol, therefore has a high level of gastric acid secretion and will develop ulcers. That is correct. However, this statement says peptic ulcer disease. The ulcers that form caused by stress is not peptic ulcer. That is a different type. That is called a stress ulcer or a curling's ulcer. Technically, they look the same, but when we're talking about peptic ulcer disease, these are the two uh, ulcers that form in the stomach and the duodenum. Are we clear? Yes. Uh, and this statement is only saying peptic ulcer, okay? That stress and anxiety are, used to be, we thought that was the cause, but not anymore. All right, only peptic ulcer though. However, stress and anxiety, uh, especially type A personality, for instance, they, they continue to be causes of stress ulcers, not peptic ulcers. Already, boss? I'm sorry, does that mean that the stress ulcers don't appear in the duodenum? 
No, they they occur uh, somewhere in the um, further down. Okay. They can, yeah, but peptic ulcer has not been linked anymore with stressing and, and anxiety. Okay, right? thank you, Professor. Yes. But all these other causes are uh, H. pylori. Um, you and I could have H. pylori without knowing it. So we may have picked it up sometime, you know, long ago. Let's say we dropped and missed the five second rule. It, it became five minute rule now. So you may have picked up this bacterium somewhere. So will you automatically have peptic ulcer disease if you have this bacteria? Well, they it's all about a numbers game in the GI tract. It, they really have to wait. Um, this, these guys here have to really multiply. But as long as your GI tract um, uh, normal flora remain high in number, there's no way these guys can cause trouble because it, it will always be a numbers game. So, so they'll exist, but you won't have peptic ulcers. Yeah, ulcers. not necessarily, right. OK, thank you. But once you have peptic ulcer, you may be um, part of the diagnostic diagnosis because the treatment will be will depend on the cause of your peptic ulcer. And these are the known causes. You know, you're an alcoholic or you have uh, you're somebody with um, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or MS who has to take NSAIDs for pain, then it could be um, it could be that. But if you that's not in your history and it's not, you know, that, that doesn't make sense why you would have one. So they'll consider H. pylori. To get that though, you have to get an endoscopy. So they'd have to get a sample of the of your GI and your know, mucosa um, and then check it for H. pylori because this one is treated with antibiotics. The others caused by NSAID, then it's not an infection, so no antibiotics. These are the complete risk factors. Um, Crohn's because they take um, you no know, certain medications. Um, but the most common are the ones listed in this paragraph. These are the other causes. So it's really H. pylori and, and chronic NSAID use that's the um, most common causative organism, I mean causes of peptic ulcer. Pathophysiology, let's go to the figure. I'll let you read the paragraph. Uh, the story is better here. So in the case of NSAIDs, how do they use, cause an ulcer? So uh, NSAIDs act, reduce pain by inhibiting prostaglandin and prostaglandin has a very good role in uh, inflammation and making sure there's good blood supply okay so it is a vasodilator so therefore if you take NSAIDs which inhibit prostaglandin synthesis less prostaglandin means vasoconstriction and these tiny cells here that are producing mucus underneath the endothelial layer of the GI tract are tiny cells. So they need a constant supply of blood. So if now you're having vasoconstriction because you don't have enough prostaglandin because you're taking NSAIDs, so these will have poor circulation. So there will be less mucus produced, so less protection in your gastric mucosa exposing them to the gastric acids now so you have no protection so instead of having these nice mucus mucus layer thick mucus uh, constantly you know lining your entire gi tract protecting them from the acid uh, that's gone so now the the endothelium is now exposed and then you have a injury so you have an ulcer there now in the case of H. pylori, the infection itself, the bacteria, burrows through the, um, the mucosa layer, causing the, um, the ulcer formation. Let's go to manifestation. So we have two ulcers here. We have gastric and duodenal. There are differences between the two. There is no table in this book, so you'll have to go through the paragraph. All right, so let's look at the pain. Pain is the number one 
distinguishing uh, factor between the two. When is the pain in the Wadnal ulcer? Thank you for reading, Mr. Wang. I'm sorry. Pain is the most common symptom. Burning, epigastric pain, aggravated by fasting and improved food or antacids, which neutralize the acid, is a symptom complex associated with a duodenal ulcer. Pain may also awaken the patient from sleep because of nocturnal gastric acid secretion. Okay, so the explanation here is where is the ulcer? In the stomach or the duodenum? Okay, so this is the next section. So at the end of the stomach, you have the pylorus there, the, and then you have the pyloric sphincter, and then it enters anything going past it, now enters the duodenum. So the normal physiology is you eat, and that stimulates gastric acid secretion. Food, though, is an antacid, meaning even though you have acid now being produced in the stomach, what, the more food you put in, the more the acid is neutralized. So that is why food acts like an antacid. Okay, so it's like eating an antacid, okay, when you eat food. So therefore, there's no pain when you're eating. The, the pain actually is relieved by eating. It's aggravated by fasting because, again, there's no antacid. So there, therefore, that duodenal ulcer is exposed to the acid. So therefore, you're, you have pain. In the case of the gastric ulcer, since the ulcer is in the stomach, what will the pain look like? Miss Esther. Yes, yeah, sorry. With a gastric ulcer, pain is triggered or worsened by eating, usually occurring shortly after meals with little or no relief from antacids. It is believed that the pain occurs when the increased acid content of the stomach and duodenum erodes the, le the lesion and stimulates the exposed nerve endings. All right, because the, the ulcer here is in the stomach itself. So that's why pain starts right when you start eating. Within within 30 minutes of eating, the pain starts. Here. Oh, and then uh, in the case of duodenal ulcer, the pain really starts when uh, about two hours, one and a half to one to two hours after eating because the, the ulcer is in the duodenum. So really the stomach acids don't enter the duodenum until it leaves the stomach because the food has to stay in the stomach for one to two hours to become liquefied and then of course all that while they become more acidic because you're adding more and more um, gastrin in there and hydrochloric acid so the moment they enter the duodenum now acid along with the food enters it then you have the pain after eating and this one, the because the ulcers are in the stomach, so that's why it, it the, the pain starts when the acid increases when you're eating. So uh, right about uh, 30 minutes. Okay. Um, thank you for reading the safety alert, Mr. Giovanni. Hello, hi. Um, do, do do not make assumptions about pain. Uh, acute pain may be a sign of complication, such as perforations. So, so, so intense epigastric pain in rigid abdominal muscles, or it may be a to totally unrelated to the peptide ulcer disease, for example, pancreatitis, co coronary heart disease, or gallbladder disease. The, uh, the 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 nurse is to encourage the comprehensive e evaluation of the pain, par particularly with an acute onset. I don't know what you're doing, man, but. <laughs> uh... <laughs> 
anyway. He's walking his uh, dog. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, diagnosis of peptic ulcer. I already said we will do endoscopy uh, right here. Uh, you can also do a bowel series. Um, there's two types of endoscopy here. We we do have a capsule endoscopy now, we, wherein you just swallow a capsule uh, with a camera, and then you poop it out later. Um, there's also a short term wherein the capsule is tied to a string, so they'll just ask you to swallow, and then they'll pull the string back up, pulling it up. Uh, depends on what the doctor want, which one the doctor wants to use, or he could do a full endoscopy. So just put the scope in, watch what's going on there. Uh, but while they're in there, they may want to stop any bleeding if if they see any. Okay, so it's both diagnostic and uh, therapeutic at the same time. So this is how they do the H. pylori. Uh, you can also check H. pylori in the um, in the serum. Okay. The, they use ELISA for that. Medications now. So the medications are illustrated, enumerated here, but let's go to the uh, gas, gastritis section uh, because all they have here is the uh, explanation on how to use it. So let's go back to gastritis. So the patient has an ulcer. They have gastric or duodenal ulcers. There will basically be five groups of medications here. One are antacids. Two are stores. These are your tidines, renitidine, famotidine, um, yeah, any tidine. You also have the PPIs, and then you have, so that's three. And then you need something to coat the ulcer to protect it from the acid. So that's number four. Now you have sucralfate. And then antibiotics for AK. And we have a uh, table there later for uh, H. pylori. All right. So, and Increase the pH of the stomach and the antacid before eating. Um, and I honestly don't know why H2 receptor blockers are still in the market. I think it's all a conspiracy because if you look at the action of H2 receptor blockers, they pretty much are taken, becomes obsolete because of the proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitors decrease stomach acid secretion over 24 hours. So why would you pick something that will only work for 12 hours? Yeah? Because um, H2 receptor blockers are usually given twice a day, say uh, 9 a.m., 9 p.m., um, not in relation to food. It's not really given, you know, before or after meal. It just needs to be given uh, the same time each day. Uh, let's say 9 or 10 a.m., just take it every 9 or 10 a.m. a day, uh, each day. No need to, you know, take it before meals or after meals. Um, PPIs, though, have to be given before meals. So it's usually before the main meal of the day. So most of us have breakfast, so it'll be before breakfast. Sucralfate is a coating, okay? Uh, as stated here, it has no effect on pH, meaning it doesn't neutralize the acidity, all it does is form a physical barrier. 
over the um, over the ulcer. So when would you take this drug? Before or after eating? Before. 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 Okay, it should be taken before because you want that coating there before you eat, before the stomach acids start to increase. All right. Um, antacids usually before or, or you can also give it after eating. Um, but most people take it after eating because, of course, there's no acid yet. So when you eat, then right after eating, they take the antacid. Um, and H2 receptor blockers, like I said, as long as you take it regularly, because they work for 12 hours. Uh, PPIs, though, have to be taken before meals. Uh, it's important to know because the, a, a patient with peptic ulcer could be on all five. Okay, they have antacids, H2 receptor blockers, PPIs, sucralfate, and well, that's four. Um, oh yeah, uh, the antibiotics. Okay, antibiotics though are only given if the patient's peptic ulcer is caused by H. pylori. Now, how are they given? So this is the regimen, so one to two weeks. However, there's a um, cocktail, okay? There has to be um, certain pairing. So this one, a PPI, clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. So this is regimen one. Or let's say the patient is allergic to amoxicillin, for instance. We will use another drug, uh, maybe uh, erythromycin, it will be uh, used to replace that. And the other is, again, another PPI, erythromycin, and metronidazole. Or you can have uh, quadruple. So you add, besides your two antibiotics and the PPI, you add Pepto in there, a bismuth salicylate. So in all cases, though, you always get two antibiotics and a PPI or you add Pepto for quadruple therapy. So again here, two, again, two, it's always two antibiotics and one PPI. Here's again, two antibiotics, one PPI, all right? So what can you say about H. pylori then? Is it a easy or hard to treat bacteria? It's hard. hard. It's hard, that's Very why you hard. hit it with two different antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Uh, not as hard as TB though. TB, you know, you required four antibiotics there and, you know, so for a much longer period. So this one is one to two weeks therapy. And that's it for the medications that go to back to peptic ulcer. Let's talk about diet now. Okay, so what should be the diet? Is there a certain diet that will be prescribed or is there a role that diet plays about healing or treating the peptic ulcer? Yes, probably avoid caffeine. Not, not really, right? There's uh, nothing is said here about what you should eat. So the general rule, I guess, would be Whatever causes pain, don't eat it. Oh. All right? Yeah. So if something causes pain, then of course, stop eating that thing. <laughs> uh, however, during, let's say you're having an attack and you're admitted to the hospital for the peptic ulcer. Of course, we will put the patient NPO. That's for every patient who has any stomach issues. So they won't be fed. They'll just be kept alive on IV fluids. And then we slowly introduce... Uh, PO intake um, as the symptoms get better. So we'll start with clear liquids and then full and then um, bland though is the diet that they'll give during a acute episode because bland diet has all of these meaning there's no in a bland diet there's no coffee there's no spices given. Um, I'm not saying we serve alcohol in the hospital but uh, you know what I mean they'll be given a bland diet they'll be given cardboard 
right, during a acute episode of a peptic ulcer. Uh, at home, you know, again, there's no rule really about, you know, eat this, not that. Um, they'll just tell them, you know, what, what causes pain, don't eat those. Because who wants to be on a bland diet indef indefinitely? Anybody? Not me. No. Oh, no, no, nobody wants that. Well, what else is life for, right? Life. Yeah. <laughs> you need to enjoy it while you can. Because yeah. one day, one day will come where you'll miss, you know, the ability to chew solid food. <laughs> Without teeth. <laughs> yeah, you'll be on. Um, yeah, right. someone will chew it for you, right, Gladys? Yeah, you'll be on pureed food. And your grandchild will chew it and then you swallow. <laughs> All right, so our complications now. Bleeding is the number one. The patient will have GI bleeding from the ulcer. Uh, that's not the only one. We can also have perforation. Yeah, perforation. Uh, infarction is not very common. Uh, these are the major ones, GI hemorrhage and perforation. Uh, it also increases your risk for cancer. Um, okay, so in some cases, it will be necessary to cut a section of your stomach or your duodenum because it's already perforated. Micro perforations are different because they're tiny, um, needle hole pricks, so they'll heal spontaneously, but if the perforation is larger than a needle prick, that doesn't heal anymore, so you have to cut that section off. So you'll either have a partial gastrectomy or uh, the same thing for uh, duodenum, so you can have a bowel resection and depends really how, how long the section that was removed um, if you lose a considerable length of your duodenum, then you'll end up with um, uh, ileostomy. Uh, but if not, they can re-anastomose it, and probably you'll get a temporary uh, ileostomy, and then they'll reverse it later once the intestine has healed. So you'll carry a ileostomy bag for... I don't know, uh, six months, and then they'll reverse it afterwards. Um, that's the only one I'm testing because the vagotomy is not really uh, common. Okay, so it's really the gastrectomy, either partial or total gastrectomy or uh, bowel resections. Now, what do we do for the patients who have to take NSAIDs? You can't let them pick. Okay, let's say, sir, you, you, uh, let's say a patient with arthritis, okay, having terrible pain daily, and they need the NSAIDs for relief. Now they have peptic ulcers. So are we, <coughs> we ask them, them to <coughs> choose? Sir, you'll have to choose between <coughs> arthritis and your peptic ulcer. <coughs> Which one do you want to treat? Well, <coughs> so that's not fair, right? So we'll continue the NSAID treatment. We'll just give them um, something to protect their ulcer from the NSAID effects. So we will give them misoprostol. Um, let me see. Pages is twelve fifty. All right, right here. Um, it's under medications. I missed it. So here, misoprostol is a prostaglandin analog. So you're inhibiting prostaglandin, right, in um, taking NSAIDs. But there are many types of prostaglandin. So this one is a prostaglandin E analog. So it re reinforces production of prostaglandin E. So therefore, you still have some uh, prostaglandin left to continue causing um, uh, vasodilation, which is helpful for the small cell 
particles that are producing the mucus. So therefore, it will lessen the effects of um, the absence of mucosal um, barrier or mucosal lining. So that's, um, and you probably heard misoprostol in OB. Yeah. Have you? Yeah, it's a, yes. Yeah, it's a, yeah. What's it's the abortion. use of this thing? What do women use it for? Uh, abortion. Right. So be careful. Mm -hmm. This drug is now controlled. Used to be this was over the counter. And then people started discovering, oh, this is a aborted, uh, you know, an abortion drug. So now they, they're controlling it now. All right. So here's now the management of the complications. So we have GI bleed. We do have um, detailed uh, management here, uh, but let's uh, discuss uh, table 57.3. GI bleed. So these are your characteristics. Sudden severe, and you'll see signs of bleeding. So if it's upper, meaning the, the blood hasn't gone through the uh, intestines yet, so you'll see coffee ground emesis, you'll see uh, bright red blood, uh, vomis emesis, so that's hematemesis, or if it makes, if the blood makes it way down, then it will come out as tarry stools. If the bleeding is <coughs> um, <coughs> extensive enough, it can cause hemorrhage. It will look scary if, let's say, you and the patient, you know, assisting them to the bathroom and then they get up, you see this large pool of bright red blood in the bathroom, right? Uh, so all you do is just, um, you know, um, take it easy and then, um, you know, put them back to bed, um, raise their legs, um, oxygen, and call rapid response. Okay. Uh, penetration. Uh, we'll skip penetration. Let's go to perforation. So this is a surgical emergency if the perforation is big. So the first thing you do is you get an order to insert an NG tube. That way we start decompressing the stomach. Uh, same thing also for acute bleed. If this is occurring, the management first action would be to put, the, put an NG tube in the patient to start evacuating the, the bleeding. Um, perforation, the same thing because the patient will be NPO. And once there's perforation, there will be no peristalsis because, in response to the injury, that there's a hole in your bowel that causes uh, inflammation throughout the GI tract, which will stop peristalsis. So, you need an NG tube again for that. Um, obstruction. Uh, this is the cause, these are the causes of obstruction. And same thing, if you have bowel obstruction, then you still need a um, NG tube. Uh, so all of these will be managed with nasogastric tube. Uh, unless, you, of course, you want to see yourself vomiting stool. Would you like that? No. Ugh. But don't worry, this is not, you know, formed stool. These are liquid stool, <laughs> you know, the stool that's in your um, small intestine. Because that's already pretty much stool, you know, that's early stool and it's liquid and you're vomiting that thing. And then sometimes you'll aspirate, you know, it's like, you know, stool in your lungs. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we had that happen. Uh, one time Elmer, uh, that was his first name. That guy had this condition. And he would just refuse. He, he, you know, not all people can handle NG2. I've seen a six foot three. Um, he looks like a NFL linebacker. No, he like a really huge guy. Okay, really muscular. And as soon as I, I showed him the NG2, he asked me, "Where's that going?" So this guy was crying, you know, pleading with me, "Please don't put that in me." So. Uh, uh. You know, a 300 pound linebacker or, you know, a, 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 <laughs> um, a defensive <laughs> NFL player telling you, you know, crying, pleading with you, not, you know, not to put that in there. Poor guy. That was a, you know, a, but I felt so much power, you know, 
me a tiny Asian dude holding a NG tube and having this much control over the guy. Oh my god. Um, okay, so with bleeding, uh, this is an emergency, so we will do, I will skip all these things here. These are the surgeries. Uh, that's Bill Roth, Bill Roth 1, and this is Bill Roth, I don't know. I uh, will skip that part. Let's go to management of GI bleeding. Um, oh, it's not here. Uh, anyway, so GI bleeding, you are having hemorrhage. So what is your priority? A, B, C, right? So put oxygen, you'll get an order for fluid boluses. And while they have the packed red blood cells being, you know, uh, thawed and type and cross match, you have to take care of the patient. So um, fluids first to expand blood volume, maintain perfusion. So you already put oxygen and then fluids, lots of fluids. Next is blood transfusion. So the blood should be ready in less than an hour. So you start the transfusion. All the while though, remember what caused the bleeding? Ladies and gentlemen, what's causing the hemorrhage? The, um, the peptic ulcer. Okay, the, the peptic ulcer is bleeding. So if it continues to be exposed to acid, what will happen to it? It's already bleeding and then you have stomach acids because this is a stressful situation. So it will increase gastric acid secretion actually because you automatically your cortisol will be released. Epinephrine will be released. All these will cause increased gastric acid secretion. So what do we give the patient at the same time? Which will stop that acid production. Because we don't want it because um, if something bleeds, you know, let's say you get a cut, does it bleed forever? No. No, uh, there will be natural hemostasis, right? So you have uh, the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway to, to stop that bleeding. So there will be a platelet plug there and then fiber information and it will stop eating. However, when exposed to acid again, what will happen to that clot that we had formed there that stopped the bleeding? It's going to bleed more. It's going to start breaking away. All right, it will start bleeding again. So to stop the re-bleeding, because the bleeding will eventually stop, but we just need it to stay that way. So in order to decrease, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, prevent the, the 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 bleeding ulcer from bleeding again. We need to have PPI. PPI, right? PPI. So we give a bowl of PPI, probably forty milligrams IV, and then you'll have a continuous infusion actually. So we'll give the patient. Uh, we'll hang a bag, of, um, usually protonics, pantoprazole. So it'll be infusing, right? Slowly um, every hour. Um, and at the same time, the patient is bleeding, so their NPO, and then because again of the bleeding, will there be peristalsis? Because there's injury there now. So will you have? Will you hear bowel sounds? No. No. Everything, no, all function there will stop. Okay, because of the injury. So you put in an NG tube. All right. So let's recap. There's bleeding. You put oxygen and then hang the fluids because ABC comes first. Next is you'll hang the uh, protonics. So all these will be ordered though. So you hang the protonics to stop the re-bleeding. And by that time, uh, that's about 30 minutes to an hour. So blood should be ready. You start the blood transfusion. And even before the blood comes, because um, it won't be ready, uh, so you put in an NG tube as well to decompress the stomach because it's better that you suck out the blood rather than having the patient vomit it because, um, of course, they'll get tired eventually and aspirate um, the, the emesis. And yeah, that's it. So we have the 
PPI infusing, and then once the blood gets there, we hang the blood, do the transfusion, and if the patient, once the patient stable, then that's the time they'll take them to the endoscopy to stop the bleeding. Any questions? Hello? No. No questions. No questions. All right, so please read the um, nursing care, okay? So that tells you here the rationale for the interventions. Um, Diet pain, okay, signs of bleeding. Okay, medications. So here's the management for bleeding. IV fluids and blood transfusion. Here's the endoscopy. Alrighty. Okay, let's take a break. Um, come back at 11 o'clock.